This is Rummy's Corner. Rummy's Corner. Good evening, boxing fans, and welcome back to the latest installment of the Top 10 by Decade Scoring Experiment. Here in Part 8, we're going to look at the Junior Welterweight Division, where we try to objectively determine the Top 10 Junior Welterweights of all time, or Super Lightweights if you prefer. As always, we will be utilizing Ring Magazine's rich archive of historical rankings. Ring Magazine began doing annual rankings for the Junior Welterweight Division back in 1928, but they discontinued the practice in 1932. They resumed doing divisional rankings for the weight class in 1962 and continued doing so through the end of 1986 before ultimately renewing the practice again in 1989. So for our purposes here, we are going to skip the two years from the 1920s and the two years from the 30s, and instead we'll begin with 1962. At the conclusion of 1962, these were the top-rated junior welterweights according to Ring Magazine. Lee Leo Loy was the champion, and he gets 10 points for being first on the list. Eddie Perkins gets 9 points, and we count down to Benny Medina, the 10th name on the list, and he receives one point. Jose Napoles is the 11th name on the list, and he gets nothing. We're only concerned with the top 10 names on any year-end list. If we go ahead and do that for every year from 1962 through 1969, our final result looks like this. Eddie Perkins topped the list with 45 points and he was considered top 10 by ring for six of these eight years. Looking at third place, we have Jose Napoles. This is the third appearance for Napoles on a top 10 list. He also finished as a top 10 welterweight in both the 1960s and the 1970s. Moving on to the 1970s, Antonio Cervantes finished first. He had a very impressive 76-point total, where he was considered a top three guy for eight straight years, including five years where he was considered the best of the weight class. Seeing him finish head and shoulders above the rest makes perfect sense here. He competed in 19 junior welterweight championship bouts during the 70s, 21 if you extend that beyond into the 80s. And then also worth noting, we have three guys here in the top 10 who also finished in the top 10 from the 1960s. Bruno Orcari, Nicolino Loce, and Eddie Perkins, who finished first from the 1960s. Looking ahead to the 1980s, Aaron Pryor finished first, and just looking at this list quickly, you can see that nobody had the numbers that stretched across an eight-year period like Cervantes did from the previous decade. And even if we had data from 1987 and 1988 here, which we don't, still nobody would have done that. But unfortunately, our data set is always going to be incomplete in the 1980s when it comes to all of the newer weight classes. Moving along to the 1990s, it was a very strong showing for Julio Cesar Chavez. He had a solid 75-point score, and he was consistently viewed as one of the very best super lightweights throughout the 90s. Chavez had a comfortable lead over second place, where we have Kostya Zhu, who had an impressive 56-point total of his own. So seeing Chavez and Zhu at the top in that order it makes a lot of sense to me. On to the double O's. Once again, we have Kostya Zhu with a solid score of 57 points, and he just barely edged out Ricky Hatton with 56. Of course, when these two met, Hatton defeated Zhu, but head-to-head -head considerations aren't factored into this scoring, so there's very little separating these two here with regards to how highly they were regarded throughout the 2000s. Floyd Mayweather Jr. is down there having just missed the cut due to his short time spent competing as a junior welterweight, 
And it's worth noting that this was the second decade where Shambra Mitchell had a top 10 finish. And even though the current decade is not yet complete, through the end of 2017, the list looks like this. Lucas Matisse is the current leader with 39 points. And looking here, not many of these guys are still competing in this weight class. It looks like it's going to come down to a battle between Postal and Matisse, so we will have to wait and see how the next two years play out before anything can be finalized here. Looking at the most dominant decades here for junior welterweights, top of the list is Antonio Cervantes from the 1970s. He edged out Chavez from the 90s. Then we have Zhu from the double O's. And then we have him again from the 90s, tied with Ricky Hatton from the double O's. In total, there were six super lightweights who finished top 10 in multiple decades. The big standout here is Costa Zhu, who had a first place finish and a second place finish. So strong showing for him. And if we add up all the totals from the other top 10 lists, not surprisingly, Zhu tops that list as well. Zhu scored 113 points. And just as a reminder, when I show these lists at the end, I've only been including points from their top 10 finishes. In recent episodes, I've been including 15 names on the list, just so you could see some of the names that just missed the cut. But for these lists I do at the end, I'm just combining scores for top 10 finishes. But in some cases, there are residual points. I mentioned this in the heavyweight episode, but I haven't repeated it or emphasized it much since. Those leftover points, points guys received in decades where they did not finish in the top 10, those points haven't been applied towards these scores on the lists I show at the end. I dropped the ball not emphasizing this point in the welterweight episode because the residual points in that instance, they would have had a significant impact on the final results with regards to Ray Robinson, Manny Pacquiao, Floyd Mayweather. So the plan moving forward is to finish the other nine weight classes, then do some quick recap episodes of the individual decades from the 1920s through the present, and then after I do those, I plan to do a grand finale type of episode where we count down the top 100 boxers of all time under this scoring system. And when we do that, we will be including all of the residual points. So if we have a guy who jumps through a bunch of weight classes where they don't score well in a single weight class across an entire decade, all of the points he ever received in any weight class under the scoring system will be counted and combined, regardless of top 10 finishes. And I will show everyone exactly where all these points are coming from. So that's the plan going forward for the rest of the scoring experiment. And as always, thank you very much for watching everyone. Hope you enjoyed. Please stay tuned for part nine. Next up, the lightweight division. Until then, have a great night.